All right. Good evening, everybody. We're meeting with Christian Viveros Fane this evening. And I think it's really interesting. I mean, I, um, clearly art criticism isn't as prevalent as it used to be, nor as substantive, yet Christian is, I think, making a substantive difference in what art criti criticism is and does. Christian, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for that. That's very kind of you. Um, I think you're doing a good job. Um, be before we really get into meaty things, I want to know, you know, maybe in four or five minutes or less, where you were born, where you were raised, and how you got from that event to being with us this evening. Right. Um, so I'm, uh, I was born in Santiago, Chile. I'm a Chilean. I still travel with a Chilean passport. I, we sort of, my family and I gypsied back and forth between Chile and the States, probably from, well, actually from when I was about a year old. My, my dad did a postdoctoral in the States. Um, we went back. The coup happened. It wasn't a great place to be. Um, and we wound up back in, in a, or rather we wound up in, in, a, in, College Park, Bethesda, and then College Park, Maryland, and then uh, Durham, North Carolina. Um, and uh, at some point, I went to university up north in New Jersey. Uh, and then I, I, I got out of Dodge for a while during the Reagan administration. I went to Spain. I, went to, I lived in Barcelona uh, from about 89 to 92, which, is, which was when I actually first encountered uh, visual arts. I mean, I, I should have had a an initial experience in, a, in an artist studio, a painter, um, you know, a guy who had a career, he's not a superstar. Wait, 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 let me interrupt and back up a second. How old right. were you when you came from Chile to the United States? It, listen, the first time I was a year old, my, my father came to do a, a postdoc, he was, he, was a, he was a doctor, a medical doctor, but he decided to go into research. So he uh, went to Duke, rather the whole family went to, went to Durham and he was a Duke and he got a PhD. And then we went back to Chile. Um, and we were there another four or five years and, you know, Chile was uh, undergoing some significant sort of political and social growing pains, unrest. Right. The coup happened and, you know, it was, as my parents put it, it wasn't a good place to bring up children if you had options and we had some options, so we left. Um, were you bilingual when you were six years old or did you learn the English when you came, returned to the United States at that point? You know, it was because I'd spent some of my childhood in the States from about age one to age five, English came pretty naturally to me. And, and then, you know, I, and then and my sister as well. And we went to, and we went to English schools, like all nice young boys of my class. Got it. Um, um, so what yeah. did you major in in college? Uh, English and political science. Okay. Very useful, very useful uh, oh, totally. uh, disciplines. Yes. Absolutely. I was, I was totally looking at the job market when I was, when I, uh, when I, when I enrolled in those majors, but, uh, yeah, that's it. And I, and I don't have, um, I don't have a graduate degree, um, graduate degree from the streets. Right. Okay. And then you went to Spain after college. I went to Spain after college. Okay, carry on years. From there. Right, and and that was like I said, my 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 first sort of you know real solid encounter with, with the visual arts. I'd always been interested in. I mean, obviously, I was interested in literature. I was smart enough, or or rather, I'd been helped along to realize the connections between, say, literature and the visual arts and dance and what have you by a couple of terrific professors that I had um, at, at university. Um, and so, you know, it was fairly natural for me to, to, to make those connections when I was living in Barcelona. I had a, a, a small job, again, from a teacher of mine who had a publishing house in New York, um, and he gave me a novel to translate, and that wound up helping me in, in the way of a cultural passport, if you will to connect with people. Um, right. And among the people I connected with, there were a lot of visual artists. And I don't think it's any secret that like writers are shut-ins and, and visual artists, you know, are, are not so much. Um, you know, they have to spend a significant amount of time in the studio, but then yearly or bi-yearly or however uh, often they exhibit, they actually have to sort of open the doors of the studio and go out and actually take the work out into the world. 
um, writers are much slower in doing that, generally speaking. Uh, so that was, you know, I, I still remember walking into this now friend of mine's studio and seeing these paintings up that I that really sort of mystified me. I, I found them engaging but enigmatic. They were speaking in a totally different language from obviously what I was used to, which was, you know, literal language, the, the, the reading, the experience of reading. Um, uh, and that really sort of that surprised me very much, and 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 that sort of, that experience has, has sort of kept a, a hold over over me since. Um, at some point, when I was in Spain, I, I a friend of mine, uh, again another acquaintance, uh, I met basically through this sort of network of I don't know artists, uh, like-minded uh, folks, youngish folks who were sort of who, who were who were uh, working culture. He was the correspondent for an American in Barcelona. And I don't know, he was busy. Uh, he couldn't get a review in. And he basically asked me to pinch it for him. And I said I had zero qualifications to be doing that. And he insisted, and I did. And that was the first review I ever wrote. Um, That's pretty nice. And it sort of went out from there, yeah. And then eventually I made my way back to the States. Um, and wound up in New York, probably around 92, 93, um, back when Brooklyn was kind of no man's land in terms of the visual arts, yep. if that could be believed these days. Um, and writing, curating, I mean, all these sort of, in, you know, in, in, should I put it, in the best, hopefully the best of uh, amateur sense possible. Yeah, it was just, because these were things that one wanted to do. There was a context to do them in. There were fellow thinkers around. Um, it was sort of the early days of the very early days of Williamsburg. There wasn't an ATM anywhere nearby. You had to, if you wanted the money or the New York Times, you actually had to get on the train and go to Manhattan um, and, uh, and pick them up. Uh, and, you know, eventually, you know, the scene there really began to, Blossom and I was part of the scene and with a friend we decided to open a gallery um, and it was you know very much not only it was a not not for profit we we sort of decided to bypass the idea of not for profits and committees and boards and what have you um, and go straight to the idea of making a putting together a space where we wanted that that would somehow or other connect with the the local scene and, and it's and it's uh, genuinely sort of like global ambitions, um, which they were global at the time. Um, so I think the first show we ever did, uh, let's see, Fred Tomaselli was in it. Uh, um, Joe Amrein was in it. Who else was in it? There were a couple of other sort of now named people. Um, oh, so really nice. And we got to review the Times. And lovely people, great people. Yes. Um, yeah, look, there was a great sort of, it was a real bona fide scene, you know. Um, and there were folks going to openings and you'd talk about art. Um, uh, the market was recovering, you know, at best. And the reason people were in Brooklyn uh, was because they couldn't afford studio rents in Manhattan or rents per se in Manhattan. Um, but they were, you know, invested 100% in basically being artists and living the artist's life. Um, so again, eventually, we went from that one time review to basically setting up a, you know, an operation that began to look more like a gallery than anything else. Um, and we stuck with it for a decade, and, and we had that space. We opened up a small space in Soho, then opened up a ground floor space in Chelsea on 26th Street. Um, and at some point, you know, we were bona fide dealers, which, you know, I, I think it took me about eight years to realize was something I was slightly uncomfortable with personally. Yeah. Dealers are great. They're absolutely 100% necessary for, you know, the, the entire eco art ecology to function. Um, I just didn't see myself in that role um, much longer. Uh, I always wanted to write. Um, and 
So, so I, uh, I, I, you know, I basically, I left the space to partner um, and start before that I'd been writing for something called the New York press, which was the, the, um, the downtown uh, opposite. Uh, they went head to head for a while with, with the voice. Um, and, uh, and I wrote for them for probably about six, seven years. Um, at some point I stopped because, you know, we were actually representing artists and doing quite well with them and selling work to museums and it just wasn't tenable anymore. Just in terms of potential conflicts of interest for me to continue to write. Um, but I started writing for The Voice in about 2008, if I remember correctly, 2007 maybe. Um, and it, it had a, a period there where I didn't write for them for, I think, two or three years, and then went back to writing for them, if I remember, 2010, is that possible, 2011? Um, so, yeah, right now, basically, what I do is I, 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 I write mainly for The Voice, art criticism, um, uh, and uh, art net. Those are my two sort of main gigs at this point. Um, I used to write quite a bit for the art newspaper. Um, and uh, books, I've just published a uh, second book that's coming out, Cartes bringing it out on a uh, Guatemalan photographer and sculptor who we'll hopefully know a little bit more about once the book is out in the fall. Um, and curating exhibitions. I, you know, I, I, I curate exhibitions, uh, museum exhibitions, mostly outside of the States. Um, uh, the uh, Museum of Modern Art in Mexico City, the, uh, uh, the Beaux-Arts in Santiago, a um, uh, couple museums in Spain. I, I curated a biennial in Dublin in 2011 that um, basically took over all the major institutions in the city, including the National Gallery of Art, uh, the Hibernian Academy, uh, Trinity College, etc. And that, that that was an interesting year, um, but um, yeah, what I do presently is again. I mean, at this point, I'm, I'm writing books. I'm doing those two sort of weekly or biweekly gigs, curating shows. Um, again, you know, mostly in institutions. Though every now and again, I do a gallery show, um, and that is it for now. Awesome. All right, so. What's the balance between doing what you love and doing what brings in money? I mean, what, what are you most motivated? I mean, you need to make some money. Some of these things you make more money than others. Yeah, you do. Um, so, what's right. your guide? How do you decide? And the, well, and you can pref you can wrap that in the question about being multifaceted and doing. You know, I'm interested in artists or art people who do several things simultaneously to cobble together a career and how those things serve each other. So it's a big old question. Have right. A it is a big it is a big question, you know. And I just got uh, through writing an essay for Alfred Leslie. He's got a show of um, a series of paintings he did uh, about Frank O'Hara called "The Killing Cycle" um, at um, Marquette University, the museum there. Um, and he was a guy who, you know, he was too he was almost too good at, at too many things. Um, and you know, depending on who you talk to, um, you know, they'll they'll tell you. Bill Pine that, um, you know, it, it, it might have been a better thing if he'd stuck to just painting or just abstract painting or just figurative painting or not films or films, uh, you know, yep. or not writing. And the thing was that Leslie was particularly good at all these things. And if you look at the history books, he was, he was a guy who really, I mean, Pull My Daisy is the first bona fide alternative film around, you know, way before Easy Writer. And he, does he get full credit for that? No, not yet. But but he's but he's in there and 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 being that active and being that um, being being that interested obviously had a real effect in terms of uh, other artists, the art world, his influence, Alfred Leslie's influence. It's a tough road to hoe, though. Um, uh, so I, I I do think it's it's probably a good thing. I, I, people generally don't have enough. Um, headspace to consider uh, certain uh, artists or writers or, or cultural figures having more than one or two sets of practices. Right. Um, and, and there's something I think to be said for trying to 
not confuse people <laughs> if you've got things that you think are, are important uh, um, uh, that you that you have to say. Um, so that's part part of the question. In my case, I've decided that I, you know I'm going to do nothing but what I think are cur important curatorial projects and again important writing projects going forward. I'm in a situation now where I can either try and promote some of those projects myself, uh, both in the writing and the curatorial, uh, way, or wait for fairly uh, good ennobling, soul ennobling, and, and, and hopefully sort of coffer-filling jobs. But that wasn't always the case. Um, uh, and, y you know, you have to do these things strategically. I know part of the mission of... Uh, artist works is to demystify the practice so I'll, I'll be very blunt and tell you exactly sort of how it works for me. The village voice pays me shit um, but it's a fantastic lost leader because everyone knows what the voice is and not everyone knows what art that is even if they pay me five six times as much um, and that's important that's very important um, it, it's certainly important for me um, if I can go to Venice for the biennial and folks know who I am from my byline at the voice, you know, that, that's a, that's a, that's a great thing. That's almost worth the, the again, it's a lost leader if you look at it that way. Um, so for you, it all fits together as part of a bigger ball of wax and different components augment your ulterior motives or objectives. Well, ultimately the objective hopefully is a certain point of view. Um, you know, uh, a even a worldview in terms of you know where visual art sits in the larger sort of spectrum of ideas. Um, but of course, you've got to be strategic about how you go about you know getting that out there. Um, both how you go about building it and how you go about getting it out there. And you know, the truth is, like I said, specifically in the case of uh, you know, eating, eating, not, not a loss, but, you know, not, not, not the kind of gain I, I, I could have if I went to, if I stuck with other venues, the voice sort of works that way. It is a, it is a strategic, there's part of it that, that is a, that serves a strategic function. Right. Um, <laughs> My turn? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess it's your turn. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> Okay. Um, how how is it determined what you're going to write about for whom? Uh, I try. And I see you. Good. I see you doing TV in the subway. I see you writing lofty, you know, erudite articles. I see, you know, the spectrum. How how much is assigned and how much is chosen? Uh, you know, right now I'm, I'm in a fairly enviable position that I choose most of what, what, what I do. Um, but the criteria for it is now, and it was different before. Um, and I'll tell you how in a second is to, is to cover what, what are the most important shows in New York? You know, I mean, New York is always crowded with great, great art, but you know, if I'm going to have a platform once a, once a week, twice a month, you know, for a, for a particular publication, for a particular venue, then, you know, I think it, at this point in my career, it's my responsibility to go, go out and try and find the show that I think is particularly important and convince the readers of why it's important, right? First convince my editors and then convince the readers. Um, you know, back in the day when I was writing for the New York Press um, and when I was doing sort of loose reviews for an America or Freeze or whatever, it, it, was, it was very important for me to make sure that um, I let people know the art world and the public in general that there were a number of other there were a number of artists who weren't sort of the well known quantities that were people you know that that folks should be paying attention to um, again on the basis of their ideas and on, on the basis of their um, of their visual luster uh, but I I, I but my role, I think, has has shifted my, for me. You know, I I think it's important for for me uh, in, in in the venues that are right for it to 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 do something else to basically try and um, promote you know the best shows out there. Um, 
part of that also has to do with the fact that I'm running for general public and I like writing for general public a lot more than I write. I like writing for um, specialized our world public. Um, part of what I'm interested in is sort of providing uh, wider access. I've always thought that the thing about the visual arts, it's certainly been my experience is that it's, it's not, um, uh, it's not, it's not rocket science. It, it can be as, as beautiful and complex as rocket science or any other science. Um, but you know, I think anyone smart can pick up uh, a good article in, in the New Yorker or something by Sheldon or something by Jerry Salt in, in New York magazine and, 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 and read it and be fascinated by, whatever exhibition, whatever artist you're talking about. Um, it's part of a much larger cultural discourse than, than, you know, than just the art world. Um, and, you know, I'm particularly attracted to writing and to perspectives that make those connections. Um, but you're right, TV, you mentioned TV. So I'm doing these things for Artnet that, that um, and I'm also talking to somebody else about possibly sort of doing a program where it's not TV, it's, it's, uh, it's digital, um, but where uh, Blake Gopnik, who, who's another terrific critic, critic um, uh, who was with Newsweek and the Washington Post for a while, uh, and I basically go to, again, what we think are the most important shows and pull a Siskel and Ebert routine, um, uh, you know, and, and hopefully are either illuminating or amusing or, you know, just outright funny. I don't mind people laughing at us uh, and, and, and with us, um, it, you know, as long as they're semi-entertained. And again, if we open up some significant access for people to be, you know, interested in, in the visual arts. I mean, you know, obviously we're all in this because we think it's really important stuff. Um, and I think it's important to, to be able to communicate that kind of passion to folks, you know. Um, Do you know before you view a show that it is worthy? I know that it's worthy of uh, the thousand words I have to commit to it. I mean, otherwise I don't write about it. I, do I, I know what I'm going to say? Do I, do I know what I'm going to say? No. How much, art do you look, how much art do you look at where you just store the information and there's not an article in it? A lot, man. There's a lot of exhibitions on. Plenty. Um, yeah. No, tons. Tons. No, listen, I, you know, there, there's the art you, you, you see and then there's the art you read about. I mean, we're, we're constantly processing this information, even more so now than we used to, right? Because we read about shows in London and shows in Sharjah and shows in uh, Vienna um, and in Mexico City. And, and it, it, uh, it behooves us to be, you know, very informed and to take on the issues and try and understand them and, and, and try and get and try and become a better filter than, than what the web gives us, for example. <laughs> you know, a big sort of scattershot amount of data. Um, uh, so, you know, what I do, firstly, is decide, right, this is the show this week, or this is the show this month. Doing Jeff Koons, even if I abhor the work, is important because... It, it's it's going to this is this is the show that's going to be discussed for the next month and a half. You know, this is a statement he's making. The museum, the Whitney is making that statement. There there are, there are going to be pro and contra positions sort of being debated. Um, and you know, in that in that situation, you want to make sure you get your order in. Okay. Um, how often, I mean, most of the people in this course have not had significant exposure in the art world. Some have, but most haven't. How often do you write about people who are, you know, grossly unfamiliar to your audience? Um, well, it depends on, on how, uh, again, I write for the general public, so I think probably more than more than one might assume. Okay. You know, um, if you, if you, if you write about a, a really large show and you're talking to the general public and you're convincing them, um, that this is worth one, uh, the reading time and two, uh, a, a visit and, you know, dispersing $20 or, you know, 
the family plan, whatever that's going to be. Right. Um, uh, then um, I, you can pretty much, it, it's very likely that they won't know who Willard is. Um, and it's important to, it's important again to sort of communicate both, you know, the, 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 the value of the work, the, the career, some, some uh, historiography, and then a sense of what the show is. Um, a lot. It is a lot. It is a lot. Do I, do I, am I in the business now of finding new talents per se? No, I don't think I am. I don't think I am. But sometimes I, you do anyway. I mean, I, I accept that that isn't your business, but yeah. it happens by default sometimes. Sometimes it will happen by default. So how does Sometimes new, how does new, whatever that new is, get on your radar? Uh, sometimes it it sort of uh, it does very organically, meaning I, I I've seen artists develop. You know, I saw them at a, a Yale when I was teaching, or I saw them in Chicago at an art fair, or they were introduced to me, and I went to the studio early, and I know the work, and I try and introduce them around to people who I think are gonna. If they if if I think they're you know they 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 merit the the help clearly you know I, I do what I can to push their careers along to the degree that I can but not with a view to to reviewing them um, if it turns out that they wind up having a fantastic show sometimes I will you know um, and generally in in that situation you know one might be the first person out of the gate as a critic basically saying you know pay attention you know this is this is uh this is terrific work this is the new as you put it what constitutes i mean i'm purity i mean i'm assuming that you have a vested interest in much of what you write about or you, you choose to be an advocate yeah, I have a vested interest. I have a vested interest in the world of ideas. I have a vested interest in, in um, I have a vested interest in a certain kind of unreconstructed <laughs> lefty humanism um, that, that as a as a as a general agenda that I sort of try and push um, with work that I think sort of adheres to that to some degree. I don't like work that. Um, exploits either other people or 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 the market. Um, uh, generally speaking, um, so yeah. I mean, I, I my ulterior motives are uh, trying to promote work that I think ha has ideas that will work for the now and for the future, um, on the basis of what we know as art history. You know. Uh, so you see yourself fitting into a larger continuum trying to bring reason I don't know if that's the right word to yeah, that could be that could be part of it yes sure yeah I do absolutely and also sort of a critical uh, continuum you know um, and and in a critical continuum that doesn't just include our criticism you know um, um, I'm, I'm as interested in, in, in talking about, um, you know, film criticism as I am, you know, uh, Greenberg. Um, do, you, do you ever talk about dead artists? I mean, you, you reference sure. them. So, um, I mean, I, I, what are the criteria that you bring to a review that gets you turned on or that gets you turned on by the artwork? I mean, a lot of times I, I, I think it's, here's something new that I haven't thought of that I find challenging that, you know, sticks with me for a period of time. Um, but if you're reviewing, I mean, like the Pierre Soulage show was, I thought, just gangbusters. Yeah. Uh, and, but it, it wasn't so much new as it was just a continuation of wonderful. Um, so what are the criteria that make you get enthused? Well, I mean, some of it's personal, and again, some of it is sort of this larger uh, worldview, belt and sham. Um, generally, it's surprise. I mean, surprise carries a lot of weight with me. Um, and, I, and I find that you know, I can be just as surprised by work I thought I knew than by work I've not really seen, um, or that's totally 100% new to me. Um, 
uh, you know, there, there have been some great photography shows at the Met over the last like three years or so, which I think are a great credit to the curatorial staff there. Um, and they've basically been recycling a significant amount of the collection and then every now and again peppering those shows with, um, with either new acquisitions or, or, or work that maybe even the museum hasn't, hasn't acquired yet, newer work, contemporary work. Um, and as historical shows, I've found them to be not only really smart, but full of this quality of surprise, you know, um, which you know, totally turns me on. I, I just think it, it's, it's, it's terrific to, to experience that. Um, which is, you know, among other things, one of the reasons why I'm really kind of looking forward to the Met taking over the Marshall Brewer building, the, the old Whitney, or the Whitney that, you know, where Jeff Coons is in now. Yeah, the word um, is bearing. Um, <laughs> are, you, are you equally good in Spanish as you are in English? Uh, yeah, but it takes me a couple of days to get up to proper speed so that I can... So when you curate a show in Chile or Mexico City, you go there and you go to you do studio visits. You work from digital images, both. What do you? How does how do you function? Well, you know, but both. But I, I also have a network of people. You know, I have a network of people that I that uh, artists that I know and curators and <coughs> and critics who I trust and we share ideas with, you know, but now that's made significantly easier because of the web, obviously. Um, so, you know, we're constantly in contact and, you know, I, 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 you know, I think it's fair to say that I know the scene pretty well. Do I know it the way somebody who's living down there 24 uh, seven knows it? No. Uh, but, but I know it well enough to be able to sort of make some uh, discriminating I think it's a really important criteria that for, um, people to understand about the art world today is that nobody's really existing in a vacuum and that, you know, though there may be surprise, you know, we all have other people who are chirping in our ears and saying, look at this, look at this. And sometimes you go, why the hell do you think that's interesting? And sometimes you go, awesome, man. I'm so glad you turned me on to that. No, you're right. You, you get a lot of that, right? I mean, yeah. you, know, you must get a lot of emails from, from people, and I, I get a lot of emails from folks who are just like, you know, will you please look at this from everyone from the, you know, the, the, uh, the well-heeled PR company um, to just folks who are sending you their stuff. Um, and, yeah, there, there are surprises to be found. They're good ones, you know. Also a lot of terrible ones, but that's, that goes, that's par for the course. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the ratio, there's more bad than good. Yeah, but, it's, so you got to expect that to be the but case. But it's also totally subjective, so that... Yeah. Which is, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but you know what? I mean, what you, what you just mentioned is important. The, the context has gotten bigger, not smaller. Um, uh, the, the, the awareness I think we have to develop is... Uh, is uh, has larger demand somehow now um, uh, maybe knowing what the art scene is like in Santiago Chile is not that important because frankly the art scene in Santiago Chile isn't that important yet but the one in Mexico City is and the one in London is and the one in Berlin is and they're different um, they're different and they're different they, they all have yeah. local quality you yeah. know I mean sometimes they, they're all showing I don't know Francis Bacon or Roy Lichtenstein or right. Louise Bourgeois, but they also have elements that are strictly their own that participate in a larger dialogue, but add a perspective to it. Absolutely. And you know, the, those artists are going to basically wind up at the major museums and they do so increasingly in, in Chicago and in New York and in LA and in Miami um, and in all the other sort of major uh, American venues. Um, so yeah, it's increasingly important to know what that's about. You know, because because the the borders have gotten for us. You know, um, totally. Yeah, but it's also, also makes it more interesting. I mean, do you know Akio Aoki, who's uh, you know a gallery curator in Sao Paulo, and you know exhibits. You saw his booth at the Freeze Fair. But so many of the artists that he shows are artists that I'm not familiar with on an ongoing basis. But you know, they're still playing in the same big, big, large arena. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And it's important to know, for example, that like a, a, a couple of years running, um, not this year, but two years previous, um, uh, Brazil had um, more people going, I think it must have been per capita, more people going to uh, museum uh, events than any other country in the world, um, which is bizarre to consider. But, but yeah, yeah that, that was the right. case. Yeah. Let's open this up to some questions. There are people in the chat thing, you know, asking good questions, and I see that people are liking Barbara's questions. So, Barbara, I have um, unmuted you. Go ahead, Barbara Thomas, and ask, you know, go ahead, ask your question. Well, in listening to this, I was wondering about one, uh, how does he describe a terrific work? What experience does it do for him? Two, how wait, does wait, he wait, define wait, 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 let's just do one, and then we'll get back to the second one. <laughs> Because otherwise we'll forget the first one. We're, we're men. We're not that, you know, as competent. Uh, what Christian, what constitutes a terrific work of art? Uh, you know, a certain sort of uh, conceptual complexity. There are visual demands as well. Um, uh, content, I think, is something that's increasingly important for me. Um, I think we go in and out of uh, art historical cycles, historical cycles where content is more important and less important. And we're in a place, I think, where we're probably, where we're, I, I think we're sort of in a hinge moment right now where sort of content is making some kind of significant comeback. That is what works are about, the ideas that they carry, as opposed to the surface, the retinal uh, experience of the work. Um, as, a, as an art critic, I think one has to be Catholic with a small c. Um, you know, about one's taste. Because I think the major responsibility is to basically, like I said before, register the most important art events, exhibitions specifically, on view in the place that is arguably still um, the center of the art world. Right? Um, we can take that on as an issue uh, later or not, um, uh, but it still is in large degree, New York City. Uh, so, you know, you, you take all these elements and, and you, you evaluate them um, and, you know, you, you decide whether or not these things have the quality of surprise that you're looking for, rich content, rich sort of uh, retinal visual experience, um, and you weigh them and you decide, right, whether they work on this basis, on that basis, on the other, where they fail, where they uh, – that that's essentially how I go about doing it. There's no formula, obviously, um, but but one of those things really has to sort of like knock you over the head, um, uh, and an impact uh, you. I think for 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 me to feel like I'm I'm looking at something that I really want to write about and I really sort of want to promote, as it were, um, or not, or 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 debunk, because that's the other option, right? Um, and I think it's just as important to be, to promote, to be advocate for certain kinds of work uh, as it is to be a, a, an advocate for ideas that are counter to the ideas that one finds um, uh, to be dominant or orthodox uh, in the current sort of cultural environment. Let me take Elisa, Elisa's question and then come back to Barbara because I, I was going to ask Elisa's question and I find it relevant and I have to, there you are, let me unmute you. Elisa, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for being here. Does the conceptual approach to the content trump the craftsmanship in your eyes or are both equally important? It sort of depends on the work, you know. Franz it depends West. on the work. I'm not sure where I can get his conceptual handle to be perfectly frank with you. That's for me, it's largely sort of visual and it, I'm not a huge friends West lover, but it's Luke it's Toyman. Okay. Right. Depending whether it's earlier. Well, he's always sort of had a content thing going. Um, there's a bit of a slip with Toyman. He gets very heavy. Um, and the stuff is so light retinally that somehow or other, look, that, <laughs> that, you, you know, where I'm going. but that, you always want to have um, work that has that a great marriage of form and content, right? You want stuff that, that is unitary in, 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 in that sense. Um, but that isn't always available. And that's not always what the artist wants you to experience either. 
Um, uh, I mean, you know, Ankawara really wasn't interested in you having a great uh, a visual experience. <laughs> that wasn't what the work was about. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, that, that, that's the thing. I did, optimally, I just went to a, um, uh, a time which if anyone's in New York, uh, I think they should go see it. I think it's... Let me repeat that again, you know, because you, Christian, hold on. You um, broke up. It's gotten very little press. Who, who yeah. are you talking about? You Can broke you hear me? Yeah, Tom but Friedman. you broke up. Tom Friedman. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's a Tom Friedman show. It's in Bushwick. It's in uh, a Luring Augustine Bushwick, which is, you know, really sort of the reason why it hasn't gotten as much play, um, critically. Um, but it's a terrific show. And one of the things that a guy like Tom Friedman does, because a lot of his work is basically sort of fool the eye, is, you know, give you a great sort of retinal experience and a ton of, it, it, it seems like a, a, like a very deep well of content. Um, but like I said, those are the exceptions. There, there, there are, there, there's, there's work that, you know, when the artist clearly doesn't want you to talk Bergera is a terrific artist. True. It's, he's all content. The Astro Gates is a terrific I, I artist, are. and he's probably largely content. I mean, think about the Astro Gates. Yes. I have a difficult time defending some of the work, uh, qua, you know, uh, um, uh, it, it's retinal presentation. Because somehow or other, it's, it's not quite immaterial, but it's not the main thrust of the work. No, the main the thrust, thrust, yeah, right. Field. Yeah, I mean the thrust. It's a social of, engagement. Yeah, it may not even be art, but the, the art subsidizes, you know, the social engagement. Right, right. And mm -hmm. some people chastise him for that. I think you know, you know, it's called progress. Right, you know, but but then again, you know, I I, I think that Fiester and a number of people who who work it in that in that way. Um, uh, are really about the newest thing that's happening these days. You know, I mean, I, th I think the move towards socially engaged art is, I, I mean, God forbid everyone should do it because it would make for as, as impoverished an, an art environment as if everyone decided to sort of, you know, do nothing but abstract expressionist uh, works or, um, but, but I really think he's the, they're the new. And it also seems to me that they're playing with the ultimate sort of like, uh, with the ultimate material to play with money. The is pretty good at it. Yeah. Um, all right, Barbara, you wanted to ask a second question and you thought I was going to forget, but I didn't. Go ahead. <laughs> well, it, I'm confused with what is, uh, to bear with me, you know, the, the definition, what is the definition for content versus subject matter versus quality? Let's use them interchangeably, shall we? Content versus, um, Content equals subject matter. And how do you define subject matter? Content. Content. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, can whip out, we can whip out the dictionary. Um, no, listen, they're, they're generally sort of the ideas that animate the projects. I mean, we, we know from conceptualism, for example, that, you know, we went through a period where essentially what you saw really wasn't that important. It were the ideas... In fact, the ideas were paramount. Um, it was art as idea. Um, and then, you know, we slipped back in, into, into an era where the retinal really sort of regained primacy. Um, and if you ask me, a certain kind of retinality or a certain kind of visuality regained primacy thanks to, you know, it being particularly good um, uh, shiny, reflective, positional goods. Jonathan um, Lasker is an example? No, Jonathan Lasker is, is I think, a terrific uh, uh, abstract painter. Um, yeah, but it's uh, yeah, yeah, but retinality per se isn't, isn't an issue. I mean, rather, it's not a problem. I mean, none of these things really are a problem. No, I don't think it's a problem. Uh, I think it's beautiful yeah, work. I totally agree with you. Um, but you know, maybe uh, Julian um, uh, Lucian Smith, you know, who's a total ripoff of, um, of older expressionist styles and who's, you know, essentially, uh, 
been lifted by a number of sort of speculator investors into the big leagues of, of, uh, of, of, of sales. Um, you know, I think there we're, we're facing another we're facing another set of issues. Um, and there is a lot of abstract work out there right now that is perfect uh, 1% one percenter catnip, investor catnip. That's a um, great phrase. And, you know, and a guy like, like, Julie, like Lucian Smith and a, and, a, and a number of other young to youngish artists um, uh, are, in that, are in that group, you know. We can't have this discussion without talking about the monetary hyperbole that's taking place in the art world today. Is there anything good about it? Uh, yeah, there's some money in people's pockets, but unfortunately it's, it's, you know, you always want artists to get paid, but the question is who gets paid. And the issue is that just like in the, macro economy and, and, and the, and the, and the, and the macro social sphere in the art world and that micro economy and that micro social sphere, the people that benefit um, are the folks who can entice the very, very wealthy with shiny product um, uh, and it's shiny speculative product. I should say, I mean, the issue is not just that it's commodified. The issue is that it's financialized. Uh, it's a different, it's a, it's a different set of problems. It's a turn of the screw on what we used to think about um, uh, with art before as being, you know, finding art that was too commercial. Now what we're finding is essentially there's, there's a kind of art out there that works as, as asset um, and that trades as assets. And that, and, that, and that is a new thing. And that is a new thing of our specific epic. But just like in the larger macro economy, there's a total bifurcation in terms of the, the market. There are some people, a very few people, who are doing very, very well. And some people at the bottom who are doing okay, younger artists. Everyone in the middle, not so much. And that's a huge issue. If you think about it in a similar way to the arguments that are made against um, that bifurcation in larger society, right? And we're talking about this not being just a problem for the U.S. This is a global issue. Um, what, what we've seen is the, the, the erosion of, of uh, not just the values, but the actual uh, um, structure of the middle class, right? Think about mid-career artists in middle-tier galleries as the middle class. And you come to understand that a, 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 a parallel erosion um, to that group of people uh, begets the same kinds of problems that you find in, lar in large society. The middle class in the art world is where the experimentation is done. It's, you know, those, that's a great breeding ground for new ideas. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's an absolutely fundamental part of, uh, of the art ecology, larger art ecology. And we're living through a period in which, just like in the larger society, it's basically being sunk. I find that a problem. I think we do. I mean, I think we all do. And I, I don't get the feeling it's going to go away or get better in the near future. Probably not. Probably and I think, you, lose, you know, you lose a gallery like Kristen Dodge. I think that's the loss to all of us. I totally agree. You know, and Kristen wasn't doing badly. She just couldn't see her way through to continued growth, which is what this market demands, you know, um, uh, according to her own lights. I think what she saw was a situation in which she was going to have to take on artists that she didn't believe in and sell in a way that she didn't believe because increasingly what you have are, are you have a lot, you have a lot less collectors than you used to. And you have a lot more buyers and that distinction is very important. Um, buyers tend to speculate on work. And in fact, what you have even more than the buyers or accompanying the buyers, the, the, the growth of buyers is, you know, these people who are essentially using art as, as an asset. They're clearly just speculating. Um, and that's a real problem. Dee, let's hear your question. Um, I've unmuted you. Go ahead, Dee. Um, hi. Uh, thanks for being with us tonight, Christian. Thank you. I was wondering, 
Yeah, I was wondering if you think the ideas need to be visually present in the work or if they can just be vocalized as um, ideas behind the project. I think it depends. I think it depends on lots of things. I mean, that sounds like a total cop out. Always, it depends, but it depends on context. Like I said, there are, um, I forget who it was that said, but some philosopher talked about um, after an age of, of uh, I think he was talking about the Baroque um, uh, or the Rococo. After an age like the Rococo, what you, what you want is an aesthetic of the ugly and the dumpy, which is kind of what you got when you think about Manet, right? Um, uh, that context informs how the reception of the work. I think ideally any critic or any viewer or anybody who's interested in art would love to see work where content again matches up with form, where, vis where ideas adhere visually into the object, whatever it is. Yeah? Um, that's in a certain way the best of all worlds. Um, but like I said, context shift, right? And, and, and I think it's important to, to consider those shifts as you go forward and make judgments, which is kind of what I'm in the business, not kind of, that's what I'm in the business of doing. Um, I should also say a, a word or two about making judgments as opposed to describing, um, because there's been, uh, there's been a lot of describing sort of going on now in, 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 um, in what passes for criticism uh, for, for a bit. Uh, and people have talked about the crisis of criticism and what have you, and partly what they talk about when they, when they take on those sorts of issues are, is, is, is the crisis in making judgments. Um, I personally think it's very important to be out there making judgments and hopefully making judgments that, that, that don't exist in isolation, that hopefully connect to other ideas in context, right? Other artists, other historic, uh, previous historical movements, um, you, you, you want to analyze, I think, art in its fullness as um, a manifestation of the cultural moment, right? I mean, we all want to see the art of our time, yeah? And I think every time I go out there, what I really want to do is to see that and see more of that. Um, and, and hopefully see not just the art of our time, but the art of tomorrow. That, that is, that, that, that's an even bigger uh, uh, request, you know. Jerry, there's a small clamoring for people to hear you, uh, have Christian address your question. Take it away, Jerry. Yeah, the etiquette with the critic. For example, if I go to a show and there's a critic there, do I introduce myself to a critic? Or if a critic comes to my show, do I introduce myself to him? If a critic gives me a good review, do I send him a thank you note? Well, you know, what is the etiquette for a critic and an artist? An artist and a critic. You know, I think most critics would be sort of flattered to have anybody come up to them and say hello or, or, or tell them, you know, the last thing you wrote either sucked or I thought it was terrific. I mean, both were, look, we, we do this partly because we were uh, supposedly contributing to the discourse, right? So, God forbid we should find that discourse, you know, live and in person with somebody, um, whether it be an artist or, 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 or a gallerist or, or a curator. Um, I, I think I, I personally find it uh, super enriching. Um, when we're all human I beings. I think, feedback. you know, we're yeah. human beings. If somebody sends me a note because I wrote something and says, hey, Thanks for the attention. I got something constructive out of what you said or did. But awesome. I'm glad you read it. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Totally. No, listen, I get, I, get a lot, I, get, I get emails from people who like my stuff and people who don't like my stuff. Um, and, and, and I actually, I'm, I'm, as, I'm as into getting uh, the objections as I am the praise. You know, um, I think it makes for sort of a healthy environment, you know, a healthy art environment. I asked this question because about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I asked this question to the top critic in San Francisco, and he said, no, 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 to everything. And I was pretty shocked by that. This is only the second time I've been able to ask this question in 25 years. Well, you know what? They're, <laughs> we're trending in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> but there are people, for example, I mean, the Times critics, generally speaking, partly because they have uh, the Times rule book to contend with. 
um, uh, tend to be sort of like very, you know, uh, aloof, um, particularly from artists. Um, they, they consider those sort of, they, they consider that uh, those encounters uh, uh, as problematic. And there's some people, some time folks, and they'll go nameless, um, who, who actually really believe that sort of piece of ideology, frankly, because that's what it is. Um, I don't think that what they do and what I do it, it constitutes, quote unquote, objective journalism. Not to say that our opinions aren't constructed in an objective manner. What I am saying is that what we do is far more akin to editorial page writing than it is to reportage. The stuff that happens basically sort of in the in the in 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 the in the A part of the paper, um, uh, ours belongs in the back, um, and you know I, I think it's it, in that context again it's important to be able to say what you want to say, you know, um, and and always have the door open to it being okay. One guy is hopefully. Uh, uh, educated, um, hopefully illuminating, um, uh, but still one person's opinion. Hey, Sam, I think your question has value. I want to hear you ask it. Let me unmute you. Um, hold on a sec. I got to scroll down to the Sam part of the alphabet. Go ahead, Sam. Do you ever find you're at odds with the artist's view of his or her own work, but you love your own interpretation of it? In other words, do you, yes. see, do you see more totally. in the work than the artists who made it did? Well, you know, yes. um, the answer is yes. I don't think Jeff Koons and I see eye to eye in his work one bit, or Sol yes. Um two different, two very different kinds of artists. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously I think my reading is right. <laughs> they think their yeah. reading is right. But... Uh, um, you know, we'll see. We'll, we'll we'll see sort of where the where the court of public opinion sort of shakes out in a lot of those. Areas. You know, clearly, I think with Coons, I'm losing. But um, but you know, and at that point, I have to uh, uh, um, recourse to history. How will history, which is always a total cop out, but, but um, yeah, it, it happens. It happens quite a bit. Let's explore that more. Who was it? Toby Toby Meyer, who said that the market is always right. Um, I mean, this is the, market is so smart. the market is so smart because it's always right. Yeah. Um, and your thought on that sentence? Oh, I think it's one of the most craven things anyone has ever said. Yeah, hogwash. In the history of art. In the history of art, I think it's just, you know, I think it's foul and disgusting. And, and unfortunately, but it, I think it's important to also note that it's, it represents a significantly large swath of opinion in the art world. You yeah. Know? Even seven years after the great, you know, we're, yeah, 2008, yeah, it was five years into the Great Recession, you know, um, you still have people. In fact, you have people who say that. I wrote a column at the beginning of the, this year. Uh, right, I, 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 got a, I got an email from, from um, a collector uh, that I, I almost couldn't believe. Um, it was actually from a PR company who was representing a collector. And the, the, they wanted me to profile the collector. And the basis for the profile was that um, this person uh, this person was so good at making value in, in, in the art world. He would right. snap up artists, very, you know, very young. And, and, you know, he listed the names of the people who, the, the, of these artists and how their value had jumped. Um, and, and, and literally came out and said, in 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 a building value in this way um outside of the art world is illegal because it's considered a conflict of interest because the art world is the last unregulated art market in the world it is not a conflict of interest in the art world um please you know come and and, and uh and um, please consider writing about how this person has built, you know, value for his own collection and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and I found that astounding because we all know that people think that way, but it, 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 it's just a bold faced presentation of it that, that is, I, I think, sort of an advance on, 
on that ethos. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. it's different from knowing that certain people are always going to think that way to it suddenly being a demonstrable cultural development where people just come out and say it because there are no consequences to be paid. Right. right. Um, cool. Does somebody have a really, a, a, unmute yourself for the last question. Who has the insightful quality last question? The, 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 the wrap up the conclusion. If I had it, I'd go ahead, but I don't. I have one. Go for it. Um, how would you describe the difference between the art that's being made in the United States and what you've curated in shows in Europe? Is there a, a cultural last, difference? Good last question. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, yes. I think the, the, the difference is that um, particularly art that's, that's being made in New York, and I'd say probably LA too, <coughs> the shadow of uh, the auction houses and um, the, the 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 big the big tent galleries, the shadow of money. I think it, it, it's it's cast long and far, you know, deep into uh, Ridgewood Queens Studios. And I think artists, um, young artists, uh, uh, and and even people who who have careers, find themselves having to struggle with. A different version of success. Well, well, a version of success that 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 uh, where, where money is far more primary now than, than it's ever been. That seems to still be the going idea. I mean, the fact that the Whitney decided to uh, leave off the the the, the Burr Building uh, with the last show with the one guy who, in a certain way, sort of epitomizes the values of neoliberalism, I think, speaks volumes um, to the sort of cultural moment we're in. Um, I don't think that show could be done in Europe, or at least could be done in Europe in the same way. Um, I think in Europe and in Chicago, Paul. Thank you. Um, there's a, there, I think there's a, I think Chicago is a really special place in that, in, in, in that sense. Um, um, it, there, there, a, there, there are, there are stronger independent artistic values that are not so attached to um, to the money making machine that help develop oppositional uh, um, uh, uh, possibilities um, and and I and I think this exists mainly outside of London and, and, and New York. Um, Chicago, I think, is a great example. I mean, one of the basic things about Chicago is that because of the schools, um, because the, the 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 I mean, the great galleries in Chicago. Um, but not the number of galleries that there are in New York. Um, uh, you don't have the same sort of weight of auction houses, and what you do have is is a uh, is an artist-run ethos that has been going in Chicago for some time. A lot of these spaces don't last more than six months or two years or five, but they keep regenerating. And and those are the these sort of alternative ideas, or even the idea of an alternative, basically is kept alive. And that is much more difficult to do in a place like New York. I mean, Unfortunately I, for me. Yeah, but you know, you travel. Um, I think that's a great last question. Sherry, thank you. <laughs> I think this has been an outstanding discussion and really insightful and I appreciate your integrity and I appreciate what you, the substance that you bring to the art world and I think you make it a better place for those of us who you know, occupy it with you. And, you know, I look forward to seeing you out there in, on the path. Um, this has been fabulous. Let me unmute everybody so we can all say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys so much.